But once I told it to them, they actually gave me the go ahead. They said, don't feel guilty because what you experienced gave you empathy to Mm -hmm. understand what we're going through. Welcome to our latest episode of Book Reporter Talks to our guest today is Angie Kim, and we're going to be talking about her latest novel, Happiness Falls, which is, hold on for this, folks, a Good Morning America uh, Book of the Month Club pick, a uh, Barnes & Noble Book of the Month, and a Book of the Month Club selection. Three things, people, and also a Book Reporter Bets on selection, so make it four. You may also know her from her multi-award winning book, Miracle Creek. I made sure to bring that down here. I cannot recite all the awards that came for this book, but it was well, well, well deserved. And it's nice to see an author continuing to write fabulous, fabulous books. Our book reporter interviewer, Nora Peel, had this to say about Happiness Falls. Angie Kim's second effort is smart, perceptive, and rich with ideas and information the kind of novel that people won't be able to stop thinking and talking about. And I agree. And with that intro, welcome, Angie. So nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Carol. This is just such an honor and pleasure. Let's start by you giving us an overview of Happiness Falls. Okay, so Happiness Falls is a story about a family in crisis. It opens with the father of this biracial Korean American family going missing. And the only person who might know what happened to him is 14 year old Eugene, his youngest son, who cannot speak because he has Angelman syndrome, a rare genetic disorder. So in order to figure out what happened to the father and also to protect Eugene from the police, the family has to really learn to connect and truly communicate with each other and with Eugene. Yeah, and it's it's one of those moments where the book opens with these two lines. I just love, we couldn't call the police, we didn't call the police right away. Later, I would blame myself Wonder if things might have turned out differently if I hadn't shrugged it off, insisting dad wasn't missing, missing but delayed, just delayed, probably still in the woods looking for Eugene, thinking he ran off someplace. So right away, we're drawn into the story on so many levels. Was that always your opener? Was that always like, okay, cold open, everybody, that's where we are. Absolutely. So this family has been with me for like, 13 years or something. So for the longest time, I didn't realize that the story would be about the father being missing. I always knew that the story would involve the father's obsession and passion for happiness theories and trying to quantify happiness and doing crazy experiments and this being a very quirky, lovable family, I think. But anyway, um, but when it came to me that the father was going missing in the very beginning, it was in the June of 2020 or so, right? When the story actually does take place. Mm -hmm. And I was doing some free writing and that line came to me, um, the opening line. And I knew immediately that was going to be the opening line, not only just because it drew me in as, you know, a writer and sort of going, oh, wow, she didn't call the police right away. Who is we? Who is she blaming? Mm -hmm. Who is the we that she's talking about and also why didn't they call the police right away and Mm -hmm. what is she feeling about that and the other thing that I think that the first line did for me which I I didn't realize until then is that she is actually talking to us from some time after the events have Mm -hmm. uh, have taken place so she's writing from a place of introspection from a place of regret of really analyzing what happened and sort of having those feelings of what might have been and what could have been. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that line, we didn't call the police right away, not only clued the readers in into as to what's happening with respect to the mystery and the police and all that kind of stuff, but really the mood that she's trying to set of like, I'm going to confess some things to you. So please have grace on me, you know? (laughs) Exactly. It's like, wait a second. I'm not sure we did this whole thing right, but I'm going to tell you the story and you're going to tell us if what you think. You're going to see what you think as time goes on. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. 
So the narrator there is Mia. She's the older twin and she's the one that's the voice of the book. She feels she's very in charge of things and her being the narrator just feels like the perfect thing to do. Was this always coming from her voice that the story was going to be told in? Yeah, I really do think so. There were some times when I thought it would be easier from a writing perspective to switch to someone else's voice. Mm -hmm. So uh, Miracle Creek, my debut novel, had seven POV voices. That's exactly. (laughs) In close third. So you would think like, okay, well, she obviously likes multiple POV narrators. So why wouldn't we go to somebody else? And I guess in a way, it was a writing challenge to myself that I wanted to do something different. So first person narrator, you know, one person the entire way through. And it really was challenging because I do this method of writing called uh, method writing, actually, from my experience in theater, doing a lot of method acting. And so I really try to stay in the head of the narrator that whose voice I'm writing in. Mm-hmm. And Mia is a lot. <laughs> she is. I love her. I really, really do. She's 20 years old. She thinks she knows a lot, um, which uh, two of my boys are around that age. And she is really smart. She is funny. She is Uh, but she can be kind of didactic. She can be a little bit, um, she can be a lot. And so she was in my head and there were times when I would come to the end of a scene and I'd be like, it would be such a breath of fresh air right now to go to somebody else, like the mom or, (laughs) you know, her twin who's like much more optimistic and happy go and, you know, easygoing than she is and, um, and see what's going on with them and sort of, you know, get some other clues that way. And I didn't because I really, at the end of the day, I do love her sort of voicey voice. I Mm -hmm. also love that um, the point that I was trying to make, which is that in a missing person, not a story, you know, to the characters, this is not a story. This is a real life that they're living through the frustration of not knowing anything about what happened to your father, someone you love who's disappeared. You don't know anything like in other crimes, you know, something, you know, you know, like in in the homicide, you know, that they died, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, here you have no idea if he ran away Mm -hmm. and he's on some, you know, cool tropical island with some new lover and that he left the family for, who knows, or he could be being tortured right now, or, you know, he could have been horribly murdered. Um, So they don't know anything. And that frustration of that, I thought staying in her head Mm -hmm. gives uh, the readers uh, sort of a window into what it's like to feel that frustration and that sense of not knowing anything and feeling so claustrophobic and wanting to escape but not being able to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's exactly the way you feel is we're trying to come up with this and we're trying to come up with this brother who cannot communicate. He cannot tell us what's going on, but she's got a twin And I thought that was really interesting as well. First of all, I know that you have boys. So I figured a girl character has got to be a lot of fun to write. And then when you sit there and say, she's a lot, I'm like, okay, what are you saying there? (laughs) She's a lot. You just gave her a lot. You created her, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got these twins there. And the fact that they are so different and the dynamic that you set up between them, also, they're two characters, but they're also a little bit more intertwined than other characters that we might see, just because- a lot of their growing up, they were going through the same things. The same things were happening to them. So is that why you chose to have him as there as well? And also somebody with her, if she's got a brother who has challenges, somebody else to lean on when you're helping your brother get through the challenges. Absolutely. So I, you know, like I said, this family has been with me for a long time. So I did write a short story about this family that was published about 10 years ago. And so in some ways I was kind of constrained by that, but, you know, but of course, then we go back to, well, why did you choose to have her be the narrator of that short story? You know, so it really goes back sort of back to that origin point. And I think I did think about this being sort of the flip side of the coin from Miracle Creek, where we were talking about sort of extreme parenting sacrifices Mm -hmm. of, you know, people who are seen as medical outsiders, as cultural outsiders, linguistic outsiders. And it's the same thing here, except that we're really focusing in the sibling dynamics and Mm -hmm. what better way 
to explore that than by having you know, two siblings who are, are close to each other and who are very different from each other, sort of be able to process that together. The, you know, what it's like to be um, in a family where you understand for all the reasons and you are so protective and loving and fiercely loving of your little brother who has medical issues, who um, has disabilities, and you want to protect him, and you still are human, and so you can't help but have resentments from time to time. Mm -hmm. And who would you turn to in that moment? You can't turn to your parents because they feel guilty. You know that they feel so guilty. So right. you turn to your sibling. And you can have those conversations. It's like, he's really being difficult. This is what, what should we do about this? What should we do about this? And have a conversation with somebody. And the whole family tries desperately to protect Eugene from the police. Eugene, let's, this is very early in the book, has shown up with blood on him. So we really don't know what's happened. Did Eugene like rage out and absolutely do something to the father? The, the, there is the option that the father ran away, but the blood on Eugene is the thing that really wants the family to keep him from going to police. Like we don't want him anywhere near. And in fact, very early, as soon as he gets home, his sister tries to make sure everything is cleaned up, that nothing yeah. is anything that they, we could actually thinking about. This is what happened, that Eugene did something like this. So are they just not trusting? Because when you have a child with a disability, the big issue is, are the police going to understand this child if we turn him over to him? How are they going to extract any kind of information out of a non-speaking person? And am I exactly. right there? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. That is so completely right. Carol, I can't tell you um, how, how um, both wonderful and kind of excruciating it's been for me this past week because I had two launch events, one in DC and one in Northern Virginia, just in the last several days. And I was in conversation with one of my students. I teach creative writing to mm. a group of local non-speaking students who are autistic for the mm -hmm. most part. Mm -hmm. And one of them, Ian, who's 25 years old, he's a leader in this community. He really wants to be a journalist and a writer. And so he is in these classes with me and he was in conversation with me and he actually confessed on stage. And I, I think I started crying like at this. He, I teared up multiple times, but one of the things that he said was it was really hard for him to read Happiness Falls because what happens to Eugene is what he himself is so afraid might happen to him. Mm -hmm. And something that people in that community talk about all the time as being afraid, because especially mm -hmm. if you have like a big guy, you know, who's like six feet tall and Eugene is you know, 14 years old, he's going through these puberty growth spurts and all of that sort of stuff. So he looks like he could do some damage and he can mm -hmm. physically. Mm -hmm. And then um, not to be able to explain to the police what happened, not to be able to answer their questions. And then out of the frustration of the inability to answer, maybe that prompting some more physical, you know, kerfuffle and who knows what's going to happen. So that is a huge fear in this community and something that we talked about a lot. And, and so it, I know that it, it's been kind of hard for, for this community. And so um, to have people like him to actually serve as first readers, mm -hmm. knowing that that was going to be difficult was mm -hmm. such a gift to me and just when he talk, talked about that on stage I was just like we were all like in tears you know right. and you know there's so many people that they've been on the, the spectrum for years mm -hmm. we have yeah. um we've uh, worked on websites for authors and one of them is a book about um I have been buried under years of dust and picture this young woman in her early 20s that verbalize that it gets that word out to her parents by doing that kind of um of being able to write by someone being putting their hand on your shoulder and that's what she says is I've been buried under years of dust and I have lots of things to say and she begins to recount things that happened when she was a young child like she's four years old and all these things that nobody knew was inside her head and for these people it's such a gift and I was reading this book with that in mind of somebody who's got thoughts and emotions inside of them and 
you have to be very uh, patient for them to be able to tell their story. And I thought you did such a good job of that because when Eugene is going to be talking to people and we won't, I don't, we don't want to, you know, share too much that like he, how he'd be able to communicate, but when he was able to do that and to see how patient you had to be, it was going to take hours for him to be able to tell a story that we might say like this, like we might just get something out and for him to share, this is what happened all day long and know that all these years, these thoughts were trapped inside. It had to be something really interesting for you to be giving the students that kind of um, liberty in a class yeah. to be able to tell a story. Yeah, no, absolutely. I remember the first time that we all met together. Um, it was, you know, it was last year. And he, they asked me, what, what made you want to actually include you know, people like us in your story, because you're not non-speaking, you know, you you can speak. And I, and here's what I told them. And I felt a little bit sheepish about making this comparison. Um, but once I told it to them, they actually gave me the go ahead. They said, don't feel guilty because what you experienced gave you empathy to mm -hmm. understand what we're going through. So what I went through is very different, but it's uh, it's my experience as a Korean immigrant. So I came over from Korea to the U.S. as an 11 year old and I didn't speak any English. And so overnight I went from feeling like, you know, a relatively smart girl who talks a lot, gets in trouble for talking a lot sometimes. And then all of a sudden being shut down and not being able to communicate the frustration of that. But not only just the frustration deeper than that, it was a shame. Mm -hmm. I felt embarrassed. I felt like a pabo, which is the Korean word for a stupid person. I felt like I lost my intelligence overnight. And mm -hmm. even though I kept on telling myself, no, that's not true. You're being ridiculous. There's a reason why I can't speak English. I still felt it that way because I think we have this very deeply ingrained assumption in our society that equates oral fluency with intelligence mm -hmm. and I had it in myself too so it doesn't matter what the reason it could be because you stutter or it could be because you don't speak the language it could be because you are autistic or have Angelman syndrome or because you have aphasia and you're locked in whatever the reason you can have thoughts in your mind that are the same as anyone else's and you are considered nonverbal, meaning mm -hmm. without words, mm -hmm. and you are you think you you feel stupid. And so when I shared this with my students and I said, I know that what I went through is nothing compared to what you guys go through because mine was limited. I knew that I was gonna, you know, eventually learn English. And also I had an outlet already in Korean, whereas they had nothing. They have for their entire life lives people assumed that they didn't have any thoughts mm -hmm. you know and because they were diagnosed with cognitive deficiencies because that's what happens when you are quote unquote nonverbal you mm -hmm. know um and so that was something that we bonded over and they sort of said yes i understand what you mean about what you went through not being you know uh half of or even a tenth or a hundredth of what we go through but still they gave me sort of permission and said, no, but what you went through is similar to what we went through. And the fact that you've actually experienced that firsthand, even in a limited temporary way, mm -hmm. it gives you a window into what we're going through. So we want you to include people like us and tell our stories. And so that just, that just made me feel uh, such a kinship with them and so grateful that um, they were okay with that, you know? Right. Right. So, okay. So you came over and this is your 11. How long did it take for you to get kind of like up to speed? Did it take till 13? Like yeah. because if there's a lot of culture you need to learn. There was, um, there are cultural references that happen between the ages of zero and 11 that you're not on the same page as. And it's, even you know, if you look, move to a different part of the country, it's hard enough. But moving from another country here at a time where, oh my gosh, everybody's got to fit in and everything's got to be. So how long? I'm I'm going on and on here, but how long? Yeah, did yeah, no, it took about two years for me to get completely fluent and no longer have an accent and things like that. So they say that the marker of when you can learn to speak 
fluently without an accent is um, really puberty. So mm-hmm. I came over before puberty. And so I was able to, so now I don't speak with an accent, whereas my cousins who came over around the same time, mm-hmm. but they were a little bit older, they actually do speak with an accent. So it's really mm-hmm. fascinating. Language is just so fascinating. Um that's but, interesting. I never had heard that before, but that's yeah. it's like the time that you come over. And you know, there's some very little children that come over and immediately, you know, they can pick absolutely. up language very, yeah. very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, I think one of the things that was interesting was, you know, you pick up uh, language receptively much more quickly. So I learned to understand English before I could really speak it. Mm-hmm. So I still wasn't speaking it, like let's say about a year and where I was speaking, but you know, in a halting way with an accent and really weird syntax and all that kind of stuff. And so people still assumed that I couldn't really understand very well. Mm-hmm. And that period was actually the most difficult because that is when I realized people were talking about me in front of me, mm, you know, because they thought yeah. you didn't know. They thought you yeah. didn't know. They thought you couldn't yeah. understand. Exactly. So they would be smiling at me as if they were like being friendly and saying something really nice, but then same thing, saying something really mean, like, oh my God, her clothes are so grody. I don't understand why she just, why is she doing that? And why does she, you know, talk like that. And it's just so ridiculous. And, you know, that kind of thing. And so it was really, uh, I mean, talk about shame. That was Mm -hmm. a really, really hard time. And, you know, and that too is something that when I told that story to my non-speaking students, they said, oh my God, yes, because people assume that we can't understand anything. So they talk about us in front of us all the time and it's just so frustrating so can you blame us for you know either tuning things out and kind of spacing out or just lashing out and just Mm -hmm. having meltdowns because the frustration and the the resentment and you know it's 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 I felt rage when that happened to me too rage mm-hmm. and shame those mm-hmm. two things are not a good combination i have to say right. but you had so many cultural references to catch up on i mean there were so many things that happened as those people were growing up to get to 11 that they can't give you a speed course and these are the really cool things beanie babies are cool or this is cool or that is cool or that and it, there's no like you know let's get a fast cultural lesson as you come into this country and i've, I've heard you talk about like you you came from an, an experience where this was a lot of new. This was like having your own room was new. There are a lot of things that were new at the same time. And to explain that to a child in the suburbs that is 13 years old is like beyond comprehension and thinking. It's just not. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. So in the 80s, this was in the 80s when I came over. So we had the preppy handbook. So I remember like reading it and studying it the way you would study like a textbook to figure out like okay what is cool like what clothes am I supposed to wear um and I remember remember uh I wrote a story about this about those Izod yes um shirts that were so in fashion and and I just thought it was those alligators and that was all that mattered just having those alligators so I took and we were really poor so I took some of the alligators off of the shirts that my cousin had um and um they were worth giving them away or whatever because he had outgrown them so I took them out and sort of surreptitiously sewed them onto (laughs) like handmade shirts and vests and stuff from Korea that my mom had made for me and I thought that that was going to make me fit in and be cool well spoiler alert no it did not it was really like the worst day I remember going to school and just all of the like titters it's funny now but it was really oh it was really 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 difficult it's so so totally difficult and you know you can understand why this family is trying to protect this child from going to the police not sure about how they're going to handle them not sure what they're going to do so as a result when you're sitting and writing you're picturing if I was that person if I was the person who came on with blood on me and I couldn't explain what happened to the police, what would they sit there and think? What would they have said happened? Especially if you're a boy of a certain age, what would they have thought you did? You know? Exactly. Yeah. And he's 14. I have a 14 year old, um, you know, so that, that was really, really interesting. Exactly. So not just being inside the head of 
Mia, our narrator, who's responding to this, but first having to be in his head to figure out how would he be reacting? What would he do? What mm -hmm. would he be feeling and what would he be doing? And one of the things that he does basically the entire day, that first day when he comes home is just escape into his room, you know, his shoes intact, all of that sort of stuff and just jump, which is mm -hmm. what he does when he is in meltdown mode and he is anxious and he needs to just calm himself self down that's what he does and he makes these high pitched noises that mia calls calls splaffing cuz it sounds a little bit like laughing and a little bit like this the spiccato on violin um that kind of high pitched sound and he does that in this rhythmic way to try to calm himself down and he does that for like 4 hours straight so that is not something that somebody who is not freaked out and going through something traumatic can do. So they know that something is happening. But imagine if he was at the police station standing there screaming like that and they would not understand what to do. And it's the reason that, you know, a lot of times they've been saying recently that we not only need police help, we need social services. Like you yes. need people to sit there and explain like this is what this person is going through right now. And it's not a reaction to you. It's just a reaction to the situation. It's a reaction to what's going on. And you do a really good job of talking about the stress on a family when a child has issues. And I'm sure that from, you know, talking to the families of the students that you're working with, you can see this because people want things to go well. And in this world, everything needs to be normal. Everybody wants normal. Anything abnormal is wrong. And it's, and you as a parent, then go to the supermarket. And if your kid starts jumping in aisle four, it's wrong that that ended up happening. Instead of sitting there going, well, tell us about your child and why they're doing that. Instead, yeah. your child's deprived of the experience to ever leave the house. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, this idea of normalcy is so interesting to me because you know of my experience, obviously being an outsider, culturally, linguistically, ethnically, mm -hmm. all of that, you know, as an immigrant, but also because of my experience being an outsider as a mom too, because I have three boys, they're all fine now, um, knocking on wood, but uh, they all had medical issues mm -hmm. that were like medical mystery types of issues that required lots of hospital visits and lots of specialists and insurance claims and all that kind of stuff. All three of them as babies wow. and babies slash, you know, preschoolers. And they were all different ones too. It was ridiculous. I would <laughs> think like, okay, I got through that with this first one, he's fine. And then something new would prop up with the second one. And, and so I also saw the dynamic and the way it played out between my husband and me, and also the way it played out between the siblings when mm -hmm. one person was going through something and then the other two had that kind of push and pull and that love and the worry, but also like the, what about me? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I have this test. Can you help me? And if as a mom, you're having to say, well, I'm so sorry, sweetie, but no, because we're at the hospital right now, mm -hmm. you know, and you sort of think, yeah, you have to do that as triage, you know, you, you, that's what you do when you have multiple kids and, you know, homework is just not as important, but to the kid, you, they, it's hard to understand, you know, mm -hmm. you try to, that you could see that they're trying to understand and they desperately want to. But that feeling of like, oh, I guess I'm not really important right now. And it's just heartbreaking. Look at me. I'm like, you can see. Yes. <laughs> Zoom, yeah, yeah. Zoom and you can see that I'm like starting to tear up already. Oh. But you're, you're really thinking, you're sitting there thinking about John and Mia. Were they always accepting of what was going on? Or were there, but at least there were the two of them that they could just go in a room and be together. And they could go off together when their brother was, and they were also Try, oh, he's upstairs jumping. Okay, now we understand that something happened. We're trying to put the clues together of what was going on. And tell us about your research into Engelman syndrome, because I did not know this. Um, I knew, I do know forms of autism. Like I said, I do know that speaking of being able to hold on to a shoulder, and I think that's called assisted talk, assisted speaking. Yeah, there is something called facilitative communication. So that's that it. Is not, yes, so that's not what's in no. Um, no, it's not this in book because what, yeah, what's in this book and the way that my students uh, communicate is nobody is holding on to any, mm -hmm. their arm or shoulder or wrist or anything. And they're just moving their own, you know, arms and fingers 
of their own accord. Um, but somebody is at, in the beginning, um, holding a spelling board up in front of them so that it's easier for them. Um, and also easier for like, for example, audiences, um, we used a clear spelling board so that the audience could see what letters he was pointing to, you know, cause right. they could see from the other side. Um, but with respect to, you know, Eugene and Angelman syndrome. So Angelman syndrome is a really rare genetic disorder and it is caused by a mutation or an, a deletion or an error. There are five or so different types um, of yeah. depending on what the origin of the gene genetic anomaly is from. And what is really interesting about Angelman syndrome is that um, it's similar to to autism in some ways in that there are some motor issues. Um, a lot of um, the children with Angelman syndrome need um, help with uh, walking, for example, mm -hmm. um, uh, and some are in wheelchairs and they sometimes have seizures um, and they also have digestive issues and they also have fine motor issues, meaning that they have oral motor issues. They cannot speak. Mm -hmm. And so they are considered by most people to have uh, intellectual or cognitive deficits. Mm -hmm. And it is really interesting. One of the things that's most interesting, I think, about Angelman syndrome and that drew me to it, because this is how I'd always seen Eugene in my mind, is that um, they actually present as very happy on the outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they have kind of this persistent smile, this beatific smile, and they laugh a lot. And it was funny yesterday I was doing, I was at a library event in Northern Virginia and front row, I had some special guests, this Angelman family and um, this young man with Angelman syndrome. And as I was talking about that, as if to illustrate, he had this huge smile on his face and he started oh. laughing out loud. And you know, so we were talking about this. We were like, you know, so everybody kind of assumes, well, they're so happy and like, yes, they have a hard life, but at least they're happy. But then some people, you know, make the point as the father does in the book, are they really happy or do, are they sometimes laughing and smiling out of pain or discomfort or anxiety or mm -hmm. shame? You know, we do that sometimes, right? Like I do, like when you're embarrassed about something deeply, you yeah. smile and <laughs> you laugh and that's, yeah. And that's mm. just a way of coping with it. And so I really feel like um, that's something that Eugene struggles with. And that's something that makes the police less understanding too, because yeah. if you're like, because we're sort of, you know, trained in our society to, you know, sort of think, okay, if your father's missing, then you should be very sad and upset and worried. And you absolutely should not have this huge smile on your face. Mm -hmm. And if you do, that means there's something wrong with you, or maybe you're evil, mm -hmm. or maybe you're just so cognitive, cognitively deficient that you don't even understand that you have a father or that he's gone or, or anything like that. So the whole family and the police are kind of tiptoeing around these issues and having to like try to really figure out, okay, what are these outs outward manifestations of his motion? Are they actually matching what is inside and mm -hmm. trying to figure that out? Mm -hmm. And then there's their police officers. They're sitting there for this long time where he's sitting there saying, this is what happened that day with the spelling board. And, yeah. but there's, there's also something that's happened with the spelling board is the father has been working on this and he's hid it away from the family and they find a couple of cryptic notes. They find a note that says something that could mean that the father had something else going on. And meanwhile, the father is working on this with this child and why everybody's like, why did he do that? And did he want to be able to present Eugene as being able to be successful at something after there were so many times where there were failed attempts of what was going on and was this pressure on Eugene and who was this other person? I mean, there were so many things that at one point in the book, you just go whoosh, like this and say, wait, there's something completely else going on here. There's like a parallel story to what the family knows. Am I on to that or? Oh, absolutely. And I think it really does go down to one of the things that they find out that the father was working on that they had no idea that he was working on, which is his theories about the happiness quotient. 
So the father was obsessed with happiness theories. Right. And, you know, like think happiness lab, um, happiness podcasts, all of that kind of stuff. And also wanted to quantify it, wanted to see if he could measure it and figure out what he could do from the sidelines to make his family happier. Mm -hmm. And of course, on the one hand, you're like, of course, he's going to be obsessed with theories of happiness because of, you know, what I just told you about Angelman syndrome and this outward manifestation of happiness. So a lot of people in that world are concerned about what does happiness truly mean? Mm -hmm. Um, If our kids are laughing and smiling and they seem happy, should we be working on genetic cures and fixes, which are, you know, like going on, there are studies going on right now. Mm -hmm. And people are sort of going, well, do we really want to fix them when, I mean, don't we always tell each other, I just want my child to be happy. Right. That's the thing that I want most for my children. So if that's what we want and Eugene seems pretty happy, he's always smiling and laughing, then we have that. We've achieved that. So why would we want to change that and make him into somebody like Mia, who's surly and stressed out and, you know, seems depressed from time to time and all of that sort of stuff. So it's really interesting in how you define happiness, micro versus macro levels of happiness, Mm-hmm. you know, all of that sort of stuff. So of course he's going to be, you know, um, thinking about that. On the other hand, he's also thinking about the relativity of happiness and the power of expectations to mm-hmm. shape how happy you feel. And so, yeah, if something happy is going to happen, like the family finds out that Eugene can actually communicate, then wouldn't it be actually the most dramatic and the most like amazing moment of happiness to sort of not tell them that this was going on and kind of save it like a surprise in a way it kind of reminds me of a little bit of what my editor (laughs) did with me with respect to making the new york times bestseller list the other day because he had some um he had he had gotten some um information that let's say, and my publicity team that sort of told them, yeah, I think she's going to make it, but they did not tell me. And in fact, they kind of like went out of their way to moderate my expectations and tamp them down and be like, yeah, I don't really know. And so that I would just be like, okay, I'm not going to expect anything. I'm not going to, I have, you know, I, in fact, I, I, I thought it was like a done deal that I, it's not going to make it. Okay. That's great. You know, I hope people are still reading and, you know, it all sort of, you know, catch on later, that kind of thing. And I was driving on my way to my first in-person event and then he calls and he gives me the news and I was like, (laughs) what, what are you talking about? I I don't even understand how this is possible. And um, he was like, I'm going to drive off the road right now. I have to go over and like talk about this, you know? <laughs> but we actually, but we did talk about it in terms of the happiness quotient because right. my expectations were so low that receiving that news like put me on this amazing high. And I was just like, I mean, just thinking about it now, I'm like kind of get giddy all over again. And so I think that's, that maybe what the father was kind of thinking about that's you know that you'll have to read to find out for sure but that's one of the things that you know the family is contemplating um and another possibility is that you know he disappeared because he wanted them to be worried and then like show up and be like ta-da I'm alive and you know that would be a that might be a very cruel but possibly effective happiness experiment, like a, one of those crazy social science experiments. Who knows? You will have to read to find out. <laughs> yeah. Did you think about all these other options? Like, oh, dad comes back, dad leaves, dad did, dad, did, did uh, Eugene did push him. That I mean, yes. there are a number of different, if you're sitting as a reader and you're in a book group and you're talking about this book, I think that there's a moment you can just sit there and say, okay, what could happen here? And yeah. Yes, and we'll have to figure out like what page you get to that, where you sit there and go, okay, what's your thought? And yeah. everybody in the book club should write down then what they think is going to happen in the book. And yeah. because there are lots of twists here of what people see, because remember now everyone has a camera and everyone's a reporter and everyone has their own way of seeing things and what's going on. And that's very much a part of this book as well. 
is what others are seeing and bringing back to the family that's changing their opinion about what could be happening. You know, am I, but I think we have to figure out what that, what's that page? We've got to figure out what page it is where you sit there and say, what happened? I love that. Yeah, It's like at the end of the paper palace, I said to my book group, okay, who did she go with this one or this one? And everybody was voting. And it was really, I said, you really saw that that happened. And it was like, just really interesting to see. But I think that there's this moment where you're going to sit there and say, what's going to happen in the book? Yeah, absolutely. And to play with that, you know? Absolutely. Totally play with that. I mean, and in fact, there are, and Mia does that too. And because yes. Mia is doing that, because I was doing that. I had no idea. I was like, you know what? There was one time when I was like, okay, just putting on my author hat here. Um, what One thing that would be a great twist um, is if somebody totally unexpected, like planned this entire thing out. Like mm-hmm. it could be the friendly and kindly neighbor. It could be even the police themselves. You know how there are those twisty stories it's where it turns sharp. out that the detective is. Yeah, yes. it could be the- Yes, it could be the therapist, it could be somebody from the, you know, it could be any, or it could be the sweet kids. It could be John, who is like, so loving. That would have actually been the best twist. And maybe it is, you will, you know, again, I'm not going to do spoilers, but, but I mean, that's the, that's the fun of it for me is that I actually did not know. Okay. Okay. You didn't know. Okay. Yeah. The entire time. So I needed to actually write in order to figure it out so that was my motivation for getting my butt into this writing chair that i'm sitting in right now that chair that thing that you've been writing in your head for 12 years 15 years all of a sudden it's like wait a second i gotta crystallize this and figure out how to get this one like you know now now down you know people ask me they ask me how to characterize this book i would say fiction instead of mystery while there's a mystery involved Yes. And I very much say that because the mystery is part of it, but there's so much more about the family. The family dynamic is such much of the heart of the book of what's going on with the son. There's so much to tear apart and discuss here. And I think that people, if you do discuss it, are going to come to it many different ways. If you've never had a child who is going through something, you're going to see it differently than if you have. If you've ever had an encounter with the police, you'll see it one way instead of you know some other way. And it's Am I guilty? Am I, you know, and it's just really interesting to see what happens to people when we're there, like, okay, for like for you coming from Korea, you had a purview of what life was like, and then life changed like that. And then what happens for people here as well? Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you're saying that, Carol, because I've really been struggling with it because I'm just like, yeah, there is a mystery. There is a missing person, obviously. But one of the parts of the book and one of the titles that I actually considered making this is uh, this is not a missing person novel Mm -hmm. or this is not a missing person story. And partly that is a reminder to the reader that this is not um, the narrator who's telling us the story to her. This is not a story. This is Mm -hmm. real life. This is, you know, so... So understand that. Um, And the second part of that is that, yes, there's a missing person in the in the beginning of it. But don't go in thinking that it's going to be all about like what happened to the missing person? Like, where is he? And let's follow the police investigation and stuff. That's not the thing that I wrote this story for. Mm -hmm. What I wrote this story to do and the reason why i think i included the missing person mystery is that that is a trojan horse Mm -hmm. into readers to hook the readers to get you to turn the pages faster to get me when i was writing it to write faster and actually meet my deadlines right but really my interest is figuring out what does something like this do to a family Mm -hmm. that's what it is that's very different from let's read this to figure out what happened to the father of course we're gonna you know try to figure out what happened to the father because the family wants to know that so Mm -hmm. deep so badly but what does it do to their dynamic when they find stuff about him that they didn't know Mm -hmm. what does it do when they find themselves wondering what if we have to sacrifice dad to save Eugene or mm-hmm. vice versa. Mm-hmm. How do we choose? You know, those types of really tough things to think about that really put that puts this family in this turmoil. That's what I wanted to get at. 
Yeah. And you know, I'm thinking of, you you see so many times that people are on the news and somebody's captured and you then think about what happened to the family. And the next time you see the family, they're in the courtroom. But what happened, what I feel like what you're doing is what happened in between? Yes. What happened between that moment where you might get to the courtroom or you're going to get to the jail and what happens to the entire family where where fingers are put and, oh, this person. And then you see the person's history and you see how there were moments that might have led up to this. But I feel like we watch the news and we see it very linearly of this, this. But you take us inside of, well, this could have happened. This could have happened. This could have happened. And this is what all these people are. Remember, there's a lot of people out there with cameras. There are a lot of people that are out there in the father was in a park. There is not the only people that were in the park. What did they see? And if they see somebody like Eugene, like jumping around or being Eugene, they may think that's a moment of being violent. They may think that's a moment of being whatever. I think that that's what you really, I think you walk away with um, a lot more empathy for people who may be in this kind of situation, because let's face it, if you're out and something like this happens where somebody's jumping or whatever, it's jarring to you. It's yeah. jarring because it's not our world. Yeah. And sometimes it's taking that step back and saying, it's still a person. Yeah. It's like when you came for Korea, you were still a person. Yeah. It's not like you. And I think that that's, that's something that I was thinking about a lot as I was reading the book. Oh, thank you so much. And I think um, a lot of people agree with your assessment about how it should be categorized like book of the month club. They categorized it as literary fiction, not as mystery thriller, you know, Mm -hmm. or um, anything like that. So, I mean, not to say that it's not in there again, I love mysteries. Um, I love uh, figuring out what happened and uh, that's part of it. And Mia is playing detective, you know, she's trying to put all these clues together. She's trying to gather everything and she's trying to filter it through herself first. She's trying to gather it before the police get to it so that she can get rid of anything that's like bad, potentially bad for Eugene, all that sort of stuff. So she's definitely doing that. But again, it goes beyond that. And I think if hopefully the readers will love this way into the story via that mystery, but then using that as an excuse almost to really tear into the family's history, some of the things that have happened in their past, some of the stories that you may initially think, ah, I don't know why this is related, but then you realize how deeply integral it is into the way that the family is thinking about how to protect Eugene or, Mm -hmm. you know, where the father could be. And so all of those stories kind of coming together as a puzzle. And then by the end, it all sort of kind of be clear to you, I hope. Yeah, yeah, it's it's clear. And especially with like one year later, and I'm going to get into that in a second as well. You also chose to set it during the pandemic. And a lot of authors have walked away from the pandemic. Like, I don't want to, you know, touch this. This time period worked because the two kids were home from college. And yeah. everybody was kind of trapped in the house. So you yeah. couldn't go places. So why, what made you decide to do it during that time period? Yeah, so I wasn't going to. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just that when I started drafting the story, I was having so much trouble focusing. I was having trouble just drafting. I just, you know, we were all being like this, I think, you know, yeah. where yeah. we were just like doom scrolling and we were like looking at numbers and all these and we had no idea. So I was just like, okay, I need a way into the story. Um, and somehow imagining this family that I had been thinking about for 10 years, thinking about them dealing with the pandemic, thinking about how their lives would be destroyed because people like Eugene really depend on routine. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. is first and foremost. So when that goes away, What does that do to the family's dynamic? Mm -hmm. And then when I started thinking about that, that's when I started just being able to write and being like, okay, so our morning was this, this is our morning. And now with a pandemic, this is our morning now, like, you know, with a schedule, like everybody gets up at 730 and this is what we do. And mom goes to work and dad takes Eugene to the park. And then, you know, being like, oh, they're in the park. I wonder what's going on because I don't know if Eugene can wear a mask because he has, 
you know, sensory issues. Right. And I knew from so many of my friends with children with autism that they were having trouble even doing things like hiking in a park because mm-hmm. they were having trouble with masks. And so thinking about that and thinking about the fact that Eugene is biracial, he presents as Asian. So what are people going to say about this big Asian dude who isn't wearing a mask and who is in the park and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And that those specific details gave me a way into the story. And I told my agent and my editor, I was like, listen, I'm just going to write it this way because I'm actually able to write now for the first time. And I don't know how long, but once I'm done with it, I'm sure we can take out all those details because it's not like really relevant to the story. Yeah. It's just a backdrop. Yes. And they said, yeah, that's fine. OK, let's think about it. And then once I was done with it, like three years later, um, I, you know, I said, hey, we can definitely take that out. And um, and we thought, you know, no, because there are so many things about the pandemic that um really bring out some of the themes of this novel. So like, for example, the masks that we wear and the masks that Eugene is wearing through this persistent smile that he has. Mm -hmm. Um, The fact that our baseline for the entire society had changed. Mm -hmm. The dad is trying so hard to change the baseline of the family so to lower it so that they'll be happier. Um, In some ways that happened to us as a society. Mm -hmm. So thinking about that and incorporating that in. So it just seemed to resonate in a kind of a macro way Mm -hmm. without my even trying to having, trying to, you know, really force that. So that seemed like a good thing to keep in. So we decided to go ahead and keep it in and, you know, hope that people won't be too traumatized by seeing some of these characters doing some of these things in the early pandemic days. No. And it's also like when someone's missing, it's like, why are they missing? And it, it becomes something completely different than what you thought. The other thing you did is footnotes. You have footnotes in the book and you have those in there. And somewhere along the way, you say you don't have to read these. Like you actually yeah. tell the readers, like, it's okay not to read these, but if you want to read them, go ahead. Yeah. Why footnotes? Okay. So I'm so glad that you brought this up because I really do want to tell people, if you don't like footnotes, you really don't have to read them. Um, so why footnotes is it's just part of the voice. Mm-hmm. So when I was in Mia's head, partly, you know, just being in her head the way that I was, I just found myself going off on all these tangents. She is such a curious person and she's curious about everything. And when I'm in her head as an author, it makes me curious about everything. Right. So I would be telling some story in her voice and then it would go off on some tangent. And then, and then at the end of the day or the next day, I would sort of like, you know, be drinking my morning coffee and reading over what I wrote the day before. And mm-hmm. I'd sort of be like putting on my, you know, author slash editor's hat, right? And sort of thinking like, okay, you know, we're kind of going off. I don't know. We're kind of coming off the rails here and sort of thinking to myself, okay, Mia, you need to just stick to the story. Let's focus, you know, that type of thing, (laughs) which is what something that the mom tells her all the time. And at some point it just came to me, you know, some of these things, they're just too long and too fun and too just wonderful that I, I love them so much yep. and I didn't want to get rid of them. They made me laugh. Yeah. They gave me joy. And I knew it wasn't completely related, you know, to um, the question of where the dad is or whatever, but it was related in some, you know, thematic way. And so um, that's when I started putting them in parentheticals and then lo- longer ones in footnotes. And I just decided, you know what, there are going to be people like Mia's mom and uh, brother John, who really don't like these. And they're going to be like, I just want to skip them. But then like be really annoyed, like, okay, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't skip them because maybe they're going to have some clues in there yes, and, whatever, yes. and then be like really resentful that they have to read them and whatever. Cause there are people like that. And I have, I have some of them in my family. And so I was like, you know what? The perfect thing is I can just give them permission to skip them. So please just, if you don't like it, skip it if you love it and are delighted by it and you find yourself laughing 
then by all means, you know, or you can, you can try them and you can have two reading experiences. You can just like read really quickly without footnotes the first time around. So you know what basics of the story is. And then you can have like a second reading experience where you like come back and read everything. And then that way you can get two reading experiences for the price of one people. Right. <laughs> right. And I'll tell you something, I'm going to read part of one. This is number seven. I've been thinking about this a lot. Remember, this is Mia talking. And I think kidnapping would have occurred to me immediately if the missing person was mom, Eugene, or John. But why dad? Why not dad? Why? Because he's tall and strong? Because John is tall or stronger? Because I don't think him is vulnerable because he takes care of us? But mom takes care of us too. And she's Taekwondo black belt and works out way more than dad does. The only thing I can think of is media conditioning. Adult men don't get kidnapped in the missing person mysteries that I've watched and read, unless they're spies or mafia affiliated, which is definitely unconditionally not applicable to dad. And that begs the question of one, what is it about women as victims that make these stories so popular? And more importantly, at least from the standpoint of perpetuating the image of adult men is strong and powerful. And two, what is it about men as victims that make these stories seemingly implausible and rare? Uh, that is just one of the little, and you know what? You go back and read those at the end. You're going to have so much fun because you're going to be back inside Mia's head of what was Mia really thinking. So there you go. So the other thing that you've got is you've got these chapters, like there are six parts to the book and each one has a chapter name. And if you're going to really sit down and discuss this book with your book group or with friends, for part one is everyone's fine. That's because nothing's <laughs> happened yet. And then we go on from you know, I love everyone's fine. I'm like, oh, that's really good. Yeah, and everyone's not fine, though. <laughs> everyone's, not fine. everyone's not fine, but if we're pretending I'm fine. Part six is 100 days. And it's like, you know, later on of, of what, you know, 100 days after everything happened. Did you come up with these sections immediately as you were writing? Or were these something you sat with the editor and go, oh, let's break this up a little bit. Let's have a little yeah. bit of... So Sorry. the sections, the section divisions came as I was writing, like okay. as I was writing organically, like, you know, there's a part when she looks at something and she sees HQ and she realizes that means happiness quotient. I knew that was the end of a section. Mm -hmm. I was like that, that is end of chapter, end of part, you know, one or two or whatever it was. So I knew I, I can just instinctively tell when it's the end of a scene, when it's the end of a chapter, the end of a section, whatever. So those divisions came while I was writing. As far as the um, chapter titles, um, those I had placeholders in, but mm -hmm. some of them we end up keeping. We ended up keeping, and some of them we ended up changing. And same thing with the parts. Like some of them, I knew. Like I knew section two was going to be happiness quotient because mm -hmm. that's just what the focus is. Um, and I knew the last part was going to be a hundred days. Um, uh, but, uh, a lot of the other ones we ended up changing and yeah, so some of them, I went back and forth with my editor and was like, oh, kind of like this. I kind of like that. Um, so it kind of like, uh, kind of similar to what happened with the title of the book itself, which used to be called happiness quotient and mm -hmm. then we decided to change the happiness falls. And so kind of like that, we had, you know, like some we knew from the beginning were completely right. And some we were like, yeah, we need to figure out a different way into that. Yeah, different way to, you know, just sit there and say, what's going to be this block? This block? Yeah. What is this block going to be about? And what is it going to say? Yeah. Do you outline in advance? Like you said, you started the story. Now you're just like, hey. I do not. I wish I could. I really, really wish I could. I, what I do is I outline as I go along. So <laughs> as I fin once I finish a chapter, I open up this like short little one page outline thing that I have and I add what happened from an outlining perspective into the outline. So by okay. the end of the first draft, I have like basically like a one or two page outline. And I just like like to look at it as I'm going along, kind of like, if you were um, driving across the United States and you were kind of like, okay, where am I? Let's just, you know, at the end of each day or, you know, like looking to right. see, even if you were kind of like going along, not really looking at the map and just sort of doing interesting things, taking detours and stuff at the end of the day, just making sure that you know where you are and mm -hmm. sort of going, okay, I wonder what that means about where I have to go tomorrow. Mm-hmm. 
And that's what you're sitting there going, okay, where, where are we going to go with this book? Um, Do you know the ending when you were starting? Did you know? No, I had no idea. I really, here's what I knew about it. I knew I had a Venn diagram. I'm looking at it right now, in fact, and it had one circle was the dad missing mystery. Another circle was the happy relativity of happiness, happiness quotient. And another, the third circle was voice fluency, not equaling intelligence. Okay. And those three circles came together and the intersection of the three circles in the middle was end. I had written ending. I knew that those three circles, I was going to somehow be circling around throughout the entire book. And then somehow the ending would bring all three of them together. I had no idea how. And I also, (laughs) and so I included that Venn diagram in like the three page pitch that I wrote to my editor um, when he bought it. He bought it when it was like 60 pages long in the very, very, very beginning back in 2020. And, um, and it was really interesting because he was like, so what do you think happened? And I was like, I have no idea what happened to the father. I mean, he could seriously be alive and, you know, happy, or he could be maimed and dead, or this whole thing could be a dream for all I know. I don't know. Probably not because I hate those endings. But, um, and I did say, but I have a feeling that we might might have a little bit of an ambiguity at the end. So I um, actually put this in my pitch letter too, like the movie Inception. Mm -hmm. Remember, did you you watch that? Okay. So, you know, we find out like there's a resolution, something happens, you know, with the father in that story, but, you know, he spins the spin and it just, you know, and, and the camera kind of like, like pans away you know it goes away before we find out if the if the spin thing is going to stop and it's going to fall over or if it's going to keep going and there's a special significance to that so we don't know and so that so there is a little bit of an ambiguity as to exactly what the ending means we know how it ends but we don't know exactly what it means and I was like you know I have a feeling that something like that's going to happen here because that's what I really believe about true missing person cases Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that that kind of ambiguity is such a hallmark of true real life missing person cases. And I can't imagine myself writing something that just goes, you know, like that, that's doing something that's outside that real lived in experience. Cause mm-hmm. I think above all else, I do like satisfying stories, but I think above all else, I like literary fiction that really tries to tell us how things are in the real world and mm-hmm. tries to make things as authentic as possible. To me, that's more important than, you know, having sort of a red bow that on top that you can sort of like tie around and then be like here you go this is this is the story and it's all completely done and everybody lives happily ever after or whatever it is and you're just sitting there like nah that's not quite the way i'm going to do it that's not what i'm going to do you know you have a number of authors in your writing group and you have a number of people that you reach out to (laughs) i if i remember correctly it's gene clock chris brigelian they're all part of this group how do you work together like how do what do you do do you send parts of books do you run questions by each other do you say I am totally stuck. Work with me. How yeah, do you do so that? All of the above. Um, so depending on the person. So uh, we do have a an author uh, virtual um, writing group and Jean is in that group. Um, and Danielle Trussoni is in that group mm-hmm. and Janelle Brown is in that group and uh, Jim Han Madsen and Tim Weed. And we send each other um, either half novels or the entire novel in an earlier draft to each other. And we meet like once a month or so. And then we we workshop them the way that, wow. you know. Yeah. And so we give each other feedback and like tell each other what works, what doesn't. Sometimes it's amazing. And sometimes it's really hard to hear, you know, all of those things. And I also have an in-person writing group that I've been with for like 12 years. And so that group, I actually gave my chapters to 
like once every, you know, two, three months, whenever I was done with a chapter, I would give it to them. So I was getting lots and lots of feedback from all over the place. And um, the, the thing about the writing group is, yeah, it's sometimes you just like are like, and it doesn't even have to be the entire group. It can be a subset. So like Janelle and I, we, I, she was probably the first person to see the first 30 pages. And I was like, Janelle, I have no idea if this is working. Will you just tell me? And if it's <laughs> stupid, just please tell me that it's stupid and that I should just like stop this and go working on something else. And so we do stuff like that with each other, you know? Right. And then Jean and I, at some point, kind of in the middle of the process, we were both working on our books. And so we both told each other that we would send each other whatever we had at the end of a week and do like a weekly check-in call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we gave feedback to each other. And then sometimes it was just encouragement. Sometimes it was just like, hey, I feel really stuck. What do you think about this? And talking over ideas. And, you know, so it could be, it was like just so many, so many different things. And, um, but just, I feel like writing is such a solitary thing and such a lonely thing mm -hmm. that having that with each other, with other people who know what you're going through is so important, at least for me, it makes me feel less alone. It makes, it also gives me confidence that these authors that I admire so much are going through the same struggles. And when yes. I say like, guys, I, I have no idea if this is good or not, that they will you know, sometimes tell me like, yeah, no, this isn't working. And I know that they're being honest with me, or sometimes they'll be like, this is amazing. I can't believe that you're having any doubts, but then they'll throughout it all, they'll reassure me. Yeah. I feel the same way. And hearing you say the same thing about your own process makes me feel like I'm not crazy. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> yeah. It's reassuring, you know, it is, it is. It is. And, you know, I read your book and I read Jean's right after it. Jean's is coming out in October. Oh, and it was really yeah. fun to read because I knew you two had a close relationship. And I also knew there's some similarities in your backgrounds. There's some similarities yeah. of the things of coming from different places and coming yeah. to a land when you were at different ages. You were at different ages, but still it was a yeah. struggle. It's like, you know, it's not like you came here and everything was like, you know, perfectly, you know, uh, right or, you know, or ever. Was this book easier to write The Miracle Creek or harder? I think it was infinitely harder. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's because of the, again, because of the expectations that I put mm -hmm. on it and that the world put on it. Um, mm -hmm. I have the sign above the screen that I'm looking at right now that says, this is not a novel. And I had that up in my writing room when I was writing Miracle Creek as a reminder to myself, I didn't have an agent. I didn't have an editor. I had no mm -hmm. idea if Miracle Creek was going to be finished ever like if I was going to be able to finish the story let alone mm -hmm. make it into an actual book that came out in the world in mm -hmm. fact I actually thought I wouldn't because I had heard from so many people the first book you try to write you write it you put it away in the drawer and then you start with your real first attempt that's what mm -hmm. I had heard and so I didn't think it was going to be a real book and um, so it was a way of telling myself, of forgiving myself and giving myself grace to say, go ahead and try whatever you want. Go ahead and put seven POV characters in there in your debut novel. Right. And go ahead and write a murder mystery where you have no idea what happened, you know, who did it or how or why or anything. And because um, it's just a way to figure out how to write and to learn the craft. And uh, whereas with this one, I has had the same sign up and my husband came in one, one day with Happiness Falls and he said, you know, that sign, honey, it says this is not a novel. Hate to tell you this, but it is a novel. It has to be a novel because you signed a contract, contract. <laughs> saying that and you got money and you have an editor who's waiting for it and you have yeah. an agent who's like going to be goading you along. So he was like, it has to be a story. And and then there were the expectations of like, oh, Miracle Creek was a certain thing. So should, does Happiness Falls have to be the same thing? Does it have to be the same genre? Like, should it also be seven POV characters? You know, all of does right. it, should, should it have a courtroom drama element? All of that sort of stuff. So there were just many more things that were weighing me down, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's like, I've done it before. It was a huge success. It did amazingly well. 
Now, look, we don't want to say this one's not a mystery because it could still win the Edgar Award. I mean, we're perfectly happy. If, it wants, if you want to nominate for the Edgar, we're totally fine with this, folks. Oh totally God. fine with it. But I think that at the time where it's pressure when you have your second book out. I know for me, I have this thing. It's something about like, is it the end? And if it's not the end, then it's all okay. And yeah. it's there's this line. I wish I could read it. It's too far away. My office is like little writing. But um I sit there and I look because there's so many times running this company. I was like, is this like, this is the end? Is this what's going to end up happening? Blah, blah, blah. And then you sit there and go, no, there's like a new direction. There's a new this, that, the other thing we're going to do. But I think it's when you're working on something, you're so close to it. I spend more time and my staff will tell you, probably this is what they should put up about me is, is this a good idea or a bad idea? Yes. And I ask that all day long. <laughs> is this a good idea or is this a bad? Do you think we should be doing this? Is this a good idea? And I learned this because years ago, there was an author where I didn't think the ad, they had a full page ad in the New York Times, the days when people date those things. And they came in and they said, I said, I don't think this is a really good ad. And I talked to somebody, you know, at the publisher and I said, I really don't think this is a good ad. This is what I would have done, you know, da, 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 da. I said, I'm going to bring it up in the marketing meeting. And that day, the um, editor, the publisher walked in and said, isn't this the best ad we've ever done? And from that, I learned when you say that and you're the boss, nobody's going to give you any feedback. So my line is always, this is a good idea or a bad idea. Absolutely. And then you get feedback from people. And you, and a lot of times I've been going, no, that's a bad idea. And I've just walked away from it. Sometimes I've come back to it a different way. But it is like, sometimes you just have to sit there and say, at least it's an idea. Yeah, <laughs> at least absolutely. I have an idea. Absolutely. And that's, to me, the reaction um, that you get from people is so important and mm -hmm. the way that I react to their reactions. So when we were talking about writing groups, to me, the most important thing is actually not even the feedback that they give me, but the fact that I can have that feedback to react to. So mm -hmm. sometimes I have, I mean, I am, I'm so glad that you said that Carol about like asking people, is this a good idea or a bad idea? Cause I feel like I do that with everything. I'm like telling my, I'm asking my husband, I'm like, honey, listen to these two different like sentences. Can you please tell me what, like, which one you like better? And he'll be like, what is the difference again? And Jean used to do that to me all the time. I'd be like, Jean, do you think like this is better or this is better? And she's like, honey, they're the same. And I'd be like, no, they're not. This one has a comma and this one has a semicolon. And she'd be like, ah, you know, and my husband too. And it's, it, but it's, what's great is about getting feedback is that once somebody says, I hate the scene, then I find myself reacting to their reaction. Mm -hmm. And even though I might have been thinking, I have no idea if this is a good scene or a bad scene, I don't know. But if I hear somebody say that, I find myself being like, either like, oh my God, they're totally right. Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's not. You're ridiculous. Like, I, I'm not going to say that, but I'm yeah, thinking yeah. in my head, like, that's a ridiculous thing to say because this is my favorite thing that I've ever written in my life. You know, like that type of thing. And it's like, it's there's something about seeing something or hearing something and then being able to react to it that really helps you to crystallize your own opinion of something. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, that's the most important thing that I get from feedback is that I, it allows me to have that reaction. Yeah. It's like, do I have something or do I have nothing? Is this something yeah. or yeah. do I have absolutely nothing here? <laughs> no, <laughs> Tell me I have absolutely nothing. And I love um, that the audio has a multi-performer cast and it's somebody being Mia, somebody being Adam and somebody is being um, Eugene, right? So I heard we've got these three different voices. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, but I love that. And I, then I take it, you read your, your final remarks. Do you re read I your do. closing? I, okay. Yes, I read my own author's note, but I have to say one more, one thing about the Eugene part, which is that the person who's reading Eugene is um, he's not one of my students, but he is in that same community. He is a non-speaker who is a speller. So you may be thinking to yourself, like if somebody's a non-speaker, how can they read an audiobook? Mm -hmm. So he considers him, himself a non-speaker uh, because he is an unreliable speaker. When he opens his mouth and speaks, sometimes he says no when he means yes, or some random words come out that he has no idea what they're from. 
-hmm. And so he explained this. And I saw a YouTube video that he had put together on his, he calls himself Autastic Tom. So kind of like autistic, but fantastic, Autastic Tom, Mm -hmm. Tom Pruin. And he explained this and he said, so therefore I cannot rely on my speech to express what I'm actually thinking. The only way I can do that reliably is by using a spelling board to spell out what I'm thinking. However, once he has something written out or even some other book or whatever, he's able to read what's put in front of him. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So he, so in these YouTube videos, he wrote all this out using the spelling method and then he actually reads it out loud. Wow. And I just found this so amazing. So I asked my PRH audio producer if she could audition him for this part because he has a dream of being a performer. And how amazing would that be? He's Lovely. 25. He's never had, you know, an experience like that. And so we did, we gave him like a bit to read and he auditioned and he got the part. He nailed it. He was amazing. Love it. And, Love it. and he, re- he did the recording and, um, and I recorded my author's note the same day in the same studio right after he did his. And it was amazing. Do you know, this book is not just a book. It's an experience on so many different levels. It's you bringing what you've learned from others. It's you shopping it with that group of people. And the final moment is you bringing in somebody like this to be a part of the experience as well. And I think that we can just look at this on the shelf and say, oh, this is this book. You talk about the cover. Cover is like, you know, got lots of interesting things going on on it. But the book becomes a lot more after having this conversation and hearing a lot more that has gone into this. And to hear that you're trying to give a voice to so many different people or understand how they express themselves. And I think there's a lot of happiness that fell on people. Ooh, is that quite good? Because of this. Oh, I love that. Happiness that fell on people. And you've got this house with like a light and there's people in here and you can just see. And you just feel like, where am I going into? What is going to end up happening here? And as you go along reading, you'll hear stereotypes that people are bringing to the story. And, you know, just what's going on, you're like completely... And I think that it's a really big, 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 interesting book to talk about. And I'm really anxious to see when more people have read it to see how the book bubbles up, because I think it is like something that book groups are going to want to discuss because it's more than just reading, you know, your, um, your absolute book, but it may also be nominated for an Edgar Award. Trust me. There's no mystery there. There's no mystery there. I'm keeping my fingers and toes crossed. Fingers, toes, and eyes, you know, fingers, toes, and eyes. Everything. And I take it you're working on something new, but gosh, you are on such a tour and so busy. I bet that's like, you know, on the back burner over here someplace, you know? Yeah, I was trying to start. I did start something um, before, you know, this came out. But uh, about two months ago, things just got to the point where I just couldn't really reliably do it anymore. And I just kind of gave up on it. And I'm really trying to um, I, I love reading. So I miss reading. I, I love writing. I miss writing. Um, I find myself really kind of dysregulated and mm-hmm not feeling quite myself if I don't don't do those things so I really really need to get back to um, reading seriously and writing and I can't wait to be able to do that but yes in the meantime there is a lot to do a lot of people to talk to a lot of events to fly to and whatever so you got a lot of secrets you have a lot of secrets you were keeping we're keeping good morning America the book of the month club and Barnes and Noble and I remember when I saw, I'm so happy to announce, when you said, I'm so happy to announce about Barnes and Noble. And I was like, I'm guessing something else. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just guessing. I like to guess as the months yeah. go on. You know, I, I like think, to guess. I think we counted like six secrets that I was keeping. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and um, there's still, a, there's still one more that's a really, really cool secret that we're still keeping. So that's really, really fun. And yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, all these secrets were fun. And then Bellatrist was another fun. Yes, that's right. That's right. Bellatrist as well, as well. Yeah, yeah. on September 5. And then um, it was also um, it was also the Amazon editor's yes. um, lead book pick, the spotlight um, pick for the best books of September, which was like an amazing 
amazing, amazing thing that I haven't even gotten to post about because the, by the time that I, I was able to like, you know, let out that secret, I was just like overwhelmed with social media. And I was like, ah, I can't do this anymore. And, yeah. an indie next <laughs> and an indie next book. And you know what? At some point you could just make a story of all of them because people may have missed stuff and just go, okay, this is everything that happened. Here we go. You know, I'm thinking of doing all my bet signs as just a story because I'm so bad at getting it to like, look, if I do a newsletter, I do these interviews. Sometimes social media just goes by like the background. I'm like, I posted a book that looked this the other day. These are all the books I read on my vacation. I couldn't have done one every day. I was trying to not do anything. I was trying to stay in the zone. But okay, here they all are. I could do one at a time, but guess what? That's not going to work, you know? Yeah, yeah work. exactly. Exactly. Right. Uh, it's, so It's been such a pleasure talking to you. This is our first time of chatting and I'm so glad we were able to do this. And I look forward to doing it again with the next book. Me too. Thank you so much for doing this. I loved the review. It was so, oh, it was so amazing. Thank you so much for that. And um, I love this conversation. Thank you so much. I feel like we're like fast friends already and I can't wait <laughs> to. Okay, like, okay. I hope it's not I hope it's not until the next time that I have no, a book. No, 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 no. We can we can catch up in between. We absolutely can. Okay. I, I knew okay, we wanted okay. you to go to Morristown. You got something else. Next year you'll go do that. You know what I mean? we we'll, we we're already I'm plotting. We're already plotting yeah. for next time. I've already got it figured yeah. out. That okay. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks To. Remember, you can find us on YouTube at the Book Report Network and podcast Book Reporter Talks To wherever you get podcasts. Thanks so much, everybody. Mm -hmm.